It's time to choose democracy or autocracy. The breakdown starts now. Good evening and welcome to The Breakdown. I'm Tara Setmayer. This is The Rick Wilson. And tonight we have a big show for you. We have the author of a fascinating book, new book called The Next Civil War, Dispatches from the American Future. That is Stephen Marsh's book. He is with us tonight. Uh, so stay tuned for him. Uh, also, we have some headlines. We've got some videos for you. You know, the, the typical breakdown stuff for you the tonight. The usual. The usual. We're, we're back in full force now. Um, Rick, I think that I, I'm, I'm deciding whether I want to start with clips from the Biden speech or whether we want to go into last week in the Republican Party. Let's do last week in the Republican Party because, I like it. you know, it's always a good energy booster. Take a look. So if you're losing faith in Donald Trump, you're really losing faith in the God that put him in office. And that's a dangerous thing, okay? Everyone needs to leave Twitter. This is a platform that thinks it's more important. It thinks that it's appointed itself as God. They're not sane like us. They're not rational like us. Like us and Mike Lindell. Is when I'm on the program with other speakers, they look and sound a lot more intelligent, you know, because I'm there. The way I phrased things yesterday, it, it was sloppy and, and it was frankly dumb. And I don't buy that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I don't buy on. that. For, look, I've known you a long time. How about the 13 elite bloodlines that have robbed us all blind? All our life is bamboozled us. All our life. Insurrection. Coup. And, and it, of course, it terrorism. Was insurrection. Saying it's an insurrection is a political term. It's a lie. I've repeatedly denounced it. They want these kids to hate this country. Uh, they want them to reject our founding, our institutions. If a government is allowed to mandate a medical procedure in China, they mandate abortions in some cases. Is this where we could possibly go? We need to take America back from the nerds. I'm telling you right now, on the authority of the Bible, if Donald Trump does not get out in front of this vaccine nonsense, he is going to lose his voter base in the next coming election. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And they keep expecting everybody to sit down there, lay down there and take it. Well, honey, I'm not no homosexual. I don't lay down for nobody. I don't take it from nobody. What is the difference between a democracy and a republic? A democracy is mob rule. A republic is freedom. Liberty, justice, all of that. This is America, you guys. This is America. Good grief. Um, I, if there was a video of it, this, uh, did you see this? These crazies talking about drinking your own urine now as a COVID. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the, this, week's new via, uh, this week's new cures for COVID include drinking your own pee, Viagra, and, and female, hor female feminizing hormones, um, which... Together, sounds like a weekend cocktail, with uh, Trump Jr. This and Kimberly sounds Gilfoyle. like something that, it, that that would not end well for most people. <laughs> um, but here we are, you know, because, you know, and, and the, I mean, I guess the er moment of all this is when Trump said that you're talking about injecting bleach and disinfecting, right? And it, it, this, it, this, it's gone on and on and iterated out further and further and gotten crazier and crazier. There will come a point when they're talking about, you know, there was another guy two weeks ago talking about eating dirt, right. which... God bless. You know, go 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 crazy with your dirt eating, but it, it really is a. I mean, it speaks to the whole disinformation ecology that surrounds everyone on that side of this equation right now. It, and it's so pervasive. Like we used to think that these were fringe people, but it's not so much fringe anymore. It's been mainstream, which is why it's so alarming because you have millions of people who are watching these outlets, who are reading these, mm -hmm. uh, you know, reading these blogs or on these social alternative social media sites now, because stuff like this gets kicked off of Twitter and Facebook 
allegedly. Um, and, and we're up against this machine of disinformation, which is one of the accelerants that was talked about in the in our guest's book from last week when we are on, uh, did our January 6th show, um, How Civil Wars Start by Barbara Walter. Uh, you, there's a theme going on if anyone hasn't noticed. Um, but that was one of the accelerants she was saying, you know, about the rise of social media and disinformation and misinformation. And when you hear people say this with a straight face, it's uh, that's exhibit A, folks. Exhibit well, you know, A. Tara, yesterday or the day before, I think, I guess, Cory Doctorow, who, who, who Cory and I disagree on everything political almost, you know, across the board, but he had a brilliant article um, basically saying, you know, th th the era of the flat earther should have been disappeared by, by, by science, by evidence, by the fact that you can go up in an airplane or a balloon and see the curve of the earth. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, he, he led into the fact that the, the flat earthers have made a huge comeback right. in this country. They've actually, in the world, there are actually like more flat earthers now than there have been in, in recorded history. It used to be a couple of cranks with a mimeograph machine, right? Yes. And now, but, but he, he very brilliantly sort of segues that into the question of the anti-vax stuff. And it is this, as we all know, the self-reinforcing social media bubbles that Facebook and other, and other platforms end up enabling that has led to people around the, this country who, who are willing to now either kill or die not to, have, not to get vaccinated. Yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's really disturbing. Cognitive dissonance to the nth degree, these people. For sure. Um, well, speaking of that, we have some January 6th news um, before we talk about Biden's speech today on voting rights. Um, so it looks like the committee is handing out a couple more subpoenas. Uh, your your buddy uh, Arthur Schwartz is listed on uh, on that list. It's yes. one of Trump Jr.'s buddies. Um, he doesn't like us very much, and uh, a couple of other people. But also there is you know Jim Jordan coming out going, yeah, I'm not going to uh, comply. And they haven't subpoenaed him yet. They're still deciding what they're going to do. But he's saying he's not voluntarily cooperating. Pence, who uh, reportedly was somewhat cooperating through his people, that. Um, you know, we might over the summer that he might voluntarily come. And and now, of course, we know that the yeah. political Stockholm syndrome hostage that Mike Pence is has decided that, yeah, MAGA world probably wouldn't be too happy if he was compliant and actually. He's afraid he's of being murdered. Let, let, let's not <laughs> let's not put too fine a point on it. And I, yeah. and I don't mean this flippantly. He is afraid he will be murdered. And if you live in a country where you're afraid to testify before a congressional hearing and afraid that you will be murdered as a result of doing that, you have to ask yourself if you really, if you really understand the things you've done and the country you live in. Yeah. Because if I were Mike Pence, I would testify, I would sing like a goddamn bird and move to another country. Uh, He's done. Oh, He's I know. Done I, in this I don't know why he thinks that he's trying to still curry favor. He is persona non grata with MAGA world when he did what he was supposed to do. I mean, I'll give him credit for that. Um, he is he's, you know, a wuss, but he did the right thing that day on January 6th last year. But he became persona non grata right there after that. You think that Donald Trump or any of his acolytes are actually respect Mike Pence? They don't. They think that it's his fault. That, that Joe Biden is now president. So it's insane that he thinks that this is going to somehow absolve him from the from the wrath of the MAGA nuts. It's not. So, nope. but now, in fairness, there are some potential legal arguments for him as vice president that he could be protected under certain constitutional protections. But whatever. I mean, that's that's in the weeds. But he but still has he, needs he still to do has the right free thing. will. He still has free will and that's agency right. as a as an American citizen as a human being to do the right thing. But this is an era we live in where the right thing is a is a is a distant memory for a lot of those people. Right. And um, I mean, he may still have free will uh, in this country, but I don't think he still has his balls. Uh, <laughs> next up. <laughs> um, so we're keeping an eye on that. It's, you know, things ha things are happening with January. 6th. A new segment on LPTV, Mike Pence's balls. <laughs> Yeah, they went on vacation with Kevin McCarthy's and the rest of the Republican Party leadership. Good Lord. Oh, Lord. Anyway, um, so speaking of someone who does have balls is President Biden. And finally, today, he came out swinging. And this is the, the Joe Biden that I think a lot of people were looking for. Um, you know, a lot yeah. of people were hoping that he would be a lot more passionate, 
publicly about voting rights and what's happening in the Senate. Now, we all may have differing opinions on what to do about the filibuster, whether that's prudent or not, how, you know, filibuster reform and all of that. I have my opinions on it because I'm kind of an institutionalist, but I get it. And politically, this is an issue that is animating the base and it's important. Voting rights are critically important. And we all know what Republicans are doing is nefarious and they know that they can't win if everyone has uh, a legal right to vote and e it makes it easier for more people to vote. They've admitted this. They've said the quiet part out loud. Um, but, uh, you know, one Definitely. of the parts of, <laughs> yeah, is it nameless? It's, yes. We have a nameless sighting today. Um, I have to go get, I have to get my, my Tiki Royal picture that was, that was inspired by Nameless's Royal picture and put it up on set next yes, time. I heard a Royal picture in the other room. Yes. Um, anyway, so, so Biden's speech today, um, I think that for him to come out now, as someone who has been so against tinkering with the filibuster because he, you know, he's right. an institutionalist. He was been around a long time and he knows that there's potential slippery slope problems with that. But he came out today. He didn't say get rid of it, but he said he was in favor of changing the Senate rules to help get some of these mm -hmm. voting rights laws passed. And um, I don't know if we have a clip of, of the of the speech tonight, but we do have an ad that we put out before the speech that includes some of the importance of civil rights that um, it's on the agenda this year. Right. We put it out yesterday. Let's take a look. It's called Dad. Fellow Americans, one year ago today, democracy was attacked. Those who stormed this Capitol and those who called on them to do so held a dagger at the throat of America. They want to rule or they will ruin. Ruin what our country fought for at Lexington and Concord at Gettysburg and Omaha Beach, Seneca Falls, Selma, Alabama, the right to vote, the right to govern ourselves, the right to determine our own destiny. You can't love your country only when you win. This is not a land of kings or dictators or autocrats. So we have to be firm, resolute, and unyielding in our defense of the right to vote and to have that vote counted. I will stand in this breach. I will defend this nation. We have a shared belief in democracy. Anything is possible. Anything. God bless you all, and God bless those who stand watch over a democracy. Yes. Now, we put that out yesterday before the speech today, but we are going to run the full Biden speech after the show tonight. So if you guys missed it today because you were like at work or doing something else because it happened at four o'clock, we will run it after the show so you can uh, check that out afterward. But something that stood out to me, Rick, that I thought was besides the fact that he went so far and finally made the decision to come out and say, yep, change the Senate rules if you have to, was that he finally couched this in binary terms. You're either for this or you're not. You're either for democracy or you're for, for autocracy, because yep. that's basically what the Republicans are, are marching toward. And he called Republicans out and in 16 of them actually voted to renew the Voting Rights Act when they were in office, when, when Bush was in office and, and renewed it. They're still in office now. Where are they? He was asking, where, where are they? He was like, if Strom Thurmond, for God's sakes, can turn around and support voting rights, you're telling me that today's GOP can't do that? And I thought that putting it in those terms was an excellent, painted an excellent picture of what's at stake here and finally put the onus on Republicans. For God's sakes, force Republicans to answer for this, because I don't think Democrats have done a good job of that yet, thus far. I agree with that, Tara. And I think I think one of the things you've seen is, is some of the uh, the inter-party and internecine fighting that's going on inside the Democratic uh, caucus and in, in, in the Democratic in the various parts of the movement. You know, Joe Biden went down there today, and the and the story of the day was not uh, Biden. In, you know, in historic move calls on the end for the for uh, exclusion of the filibuster and voting rights. The story was progressive groups are mad that Biden hasn't done enough for them. That's right, and I they stayed away uh, from the speech. And I have to say, you know, Democrats have asked many, many times, hey, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce about Republicans? What is it you, your party, your old party did that made you like so effective politically? I'm going to do two things right now. Relentlessly on message all the time, all the time, all the time. And secondly, loyalty to the president. Yes. And you know what? It wasn't always perfect, but, but Republicans understood when to rally. They understood when to pull it together. They understood to take the fight inside the tent rather than outside. And, you know, the Democrats today who stayed away from, from Biden's speech in Georgia, you know who they helped? 
Did, did they help the progressive cause? No. No. Nope. Did they help voting rights? No. Did they help African Americans in places like Georgia who are systematically being denied the right to vote? No. Did they help Joe? Did they, did they help Joe Biden's chances of leading uh, the the retention of the House and the Senate? No. Who'd they help? Nobody except their own email lists. It oh, was, they helped it was, Republicans. Uh, well, I'm getting to that. But it was <laughs> but the, the 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 people they helped, the people they gave a giant gift to, were Mitch McConnell, Jim Jordan. Kevin McCarthy, Donald Trump, the crazies in Georgia who are saying that they're going to overthrow the election results ex post facto. Mm -hmm. This was not a smart move. This was not a, a wise move. This was not a strategic move. If, you're, if your whole thing is, fuck you unless you do everything we want or we'll cause anarchy, you're not an ally. You're an arsonist. So anyway... That, it, it, it's a hell it, of a thing. That, no, you're a hundred percent right about that. I tweeted first thing this morning when I saw that that, that that was happening. I thought to myself, what are these people thinking? You know, no offense to my progressive brothers and sisters out there, but this is not the way you get things done. And it reminded me of the mistakes that they made during the Build Back Better infrastructure debate during the fall. Yep. And they, you know, they, they went through this purity test and it's either you know all or nothing and you know and what did it do it potentially cost them some of the some of the races in in the off year elections and it completely demoralized their base this is not the way to do it they, they don't have a greater ally yeah. than president biden in this effort for civil for civil rights and voting rights you don't you do not have a scheduling conflict i'm sorry stacy abrams yeah. but you don't have a scheduling conflict when the president of the united states is coming to your home state at a historic location with the optics of what they are in georgia martin luther king all of that and say oh you know there's not there's nothing on your schedule more important than maybe a surgery than going to be supportive right. of the president of the united states for an issue that she's the queen bee of i mean that is her whole political identity so i don't think that was a smart move and the democrats you know that that part of the democratic party needs to get it together they need to be supportive because you're right republicans know how to stay lockstep with each other what, through the good or the bad. Well, um, I wanna, one last thing on that. Yeah, I, I, I our commend guests. the people's attention, an article today by Jonathan Capehart uh, about the people who are criticizing Biden. Yes. As, as he said, they got the wrong guy. That's right. They're Shout out to Kate. The wrong guy on this. We equation. were talking about it this morning, actually, Cape yep. and I, about this, and you know, we were both kvetching because we we recognized that this was folly and and not a good look. But I think Biden's speech kind of cast that aside a little bit and we'll see how the media covers it. But um, he did a great job and he's getting people fired up and ready to go. And that's, that's what right. they need. And I never in my life thought I'd be repeating Obama slogans here, <laughs> but this is 2022. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's true. It's oh, true. good Lord. Help me. All right. Let's bring in our guests because now we're going to talk about another happy subject, civil war in America. Let's, uh, let's talk about that. <laughs> um, our guest tonight is author of the new book, the next civil war dispatches from the American future, Stephen Marsh, and he is our brother from over the border north of us. We appreciate him. We love the Canadians. Uh, welcome to The Breakdown. Pleasure to be here. We love you guys, too. That's why we're so worried about you. Thank you. We share the collective worry here and, yeah. um, you know, which is why even though these are heavy subjects and everyone's kind of fatigued about it, but it's important because there is historical precedent for what's percolating in the country now um, and people really need to see they need to be they need to have some imagination about yes it could happen here I think a lot of folks didn't think that they still have their heads in the sand about whether it could happen here but your book paints a really vivid picture with various scenarios about how it could happen here talk a little bit about it yeah, I mean, in the, nobody saw the first civil war coming. I mean, the, the the opinion at the time was not a single person wanted it, foresaw it, or expected it to happen. Like it just it just events spiraled out of control, and it happened. In hindsight, of course, it's very easy to see nullification crisis, bloody Kansas, and so on. But at the time, it seemed it seemed very very remote when it happened. Um, and I think we're sort of in one of those situations now where. Uh, things are accelerating very rapidly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do think people need to wake up to the possibility of, I mean, I was on a show earlier this week where somebody said, well, would a civil war be that bad? And I was like, yes. What show was yes, that? Yes, it would be that bad. <laughs> like, you know, 600,000 people died last time. Like South Carolina lost a third of the men in South Carolina. Like it was, it, it's very, very bad to have a civil war. So I, I wasn't expecting that, I must say. 
I bet. Rick? <laughs> well, you know, Stephen, I, I read your book the other morning, uh, and you and I were, 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 were DMing about it. And, and I have to say, you know, it is a, it is a chilling look at it, at, at, at this potential future, this sort of alternate future. Um, but when you're studying this, when you're looking at this, you, you have a sort of interesting, fresh eyes on it from across the border, where you're not, you, you've, you, you know America very well. You've traveled here, you've, you've reported here extensively. Um, is there a sense that you get that, uh, from, from being a, 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 an observer from, from the North, that there's anything motivating Americans to stay together, or are all this centripetal forces kind of pushing them apart? Well, I mean, there's the, the major force of inertia that's keeping them together, basically. And that inertia is body, embodied in the Constitution and the fact that the Constitution cannot really be changed. I mean, the last change was 1992, was it? Right. But that, I mean, that was just a really pretty technical issue, right. too. Not a, yeah. Um, yeah, like it, it, that was not that was not really um, a, a serious kind of amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we, part of the problem here is that the Constitution was a, is, is a work of great genius, um, but it's an 18th century work of great genius. And, you know, Jefferson said that you should update the Constitution every 19 years, um, and it's been 240 years. And that's, right. that's, that, that's a problem. What, what, what I, I mean, as to whether the centrifugal forces or the inertia forces are going to win, you know, I don't really... I, I try to stay really close to what I actually know in this book because, you know, things are so emotional. Like, I think you just need to stay sure. absolutely sure. as close to the data as possible. Yeah. I mean, the, the best, the expert opinion is it's about 67% chance of a civil war in the next five years. So that, that like, that's scary enough. I don't think we need to say it's inevitable. That's, that's definitely scary enough. One of the things I, I noticed in the book that, that you, you touched on, and I, it's something I'm sort of obsessed about, is this is really going to be the first major civil war of the social media era. Mm -hmm. Not just here, but, uh, but abroad. I mean, we saw the influence of media in, 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 in other civil wars in the past. I mean, Rwanda, you know, talk radio essentially was, yeah. was weaponized in a way that led to a, a, a horrifying genocide. Yeah. Do you have and any poetry in of... Afghanistan too? Well, yes. But sorry, yeah. yes. But do you have any sort of insight right now on on because uh, I, I know I beat this drum a lot on the of the, the the severity of the impact of social media on splitting the country and making it more likely we're going to end up in a civil war? Well, I mean, I think it is a contributing factor. But I, one thing you should keep in mind is that, you know, the social media happens everywhere else in the world, but it doesn't have anywhere near the same impact. Like in Canada, there was a campaign against our our then foreign minister at the time, Christian Friedland, where sure. you know, I, I some know. things were brought up about her grandfather being a Nazi and they tried to smear her. And the conservative member said, we're not doing this. Every, everyone should know that this reflects nothing about Christia. And, you know, th we, we consider this a non-story. And then shortly after she's, uh, you know, uh, it, so it was, they killed it, right? Like right. Th there, there was enough goodwill, like we were enough of a unified people that we were like, you know, we're not going to let Russia mess around in our politics we're not going to let uh you know these the, this this rage overtake us we're going to stay you know civilized and you know a lot of countries have come to that like germany for instance they all basically made an agreement that you know they're not going to do that they're not going to they're not going to allow this stuff to overtake their politics and it, and it worked whereas in america it was just like well this is another device that we're going to use and they went nuclear just right away right they just went like to the <laughs> nuclear option just immediately in naturally more, in more ways than one yeah. actually speaking yeah. speaking of the of nuclear um in in your book you you lay out the premise for why you wrote it the way you did and you use the historical example of the the day after which was an exercise that was mm -hmm. uh performed in the 70s about well what would happen you know let's let's war game it out what would happen if there was a nuclear war what would happen the day after and um they basically laid out the potential scenarios based on the evidence and what they knew about nuclear fallout and what could happen at, uh, at the time. And it, it informed Ronald Reagan, even when he was in, get, getting involved in yeah. uh, certain treaties and things like that in, in his foreign policy. So um, is was that kind of the point where you said, you know what, that's why I'm going to, to write this, because people need to see a visual of what the potential consequences of this, what this could look like, what could be the spark, you know, they need to see it. Because I think our, you know, we have a, a short attention span in this country. And, and, you know, you got to kind of show them the, uh, the, the cue cards in order to get people. Yeah. No, know, no, no, no. I mean, that was, you, 
you put your finger on it. But also, I think like it's a bit like the frog boiling in water. Like, you know, slowly things happen and you don't really notice. Well, it's like, well, OK, well, what does a civil war look like? What does a city under occupation by the military look like? And, you know, that's not a city you want to live in. Like mm-hmm. it, 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 it just it just is not a city that you want to live in, one that's occupied by the by the military. Um, so, yeah, that that is why I did it. I mean, th- the day after was such a model for me. Of course, that was a piece of fiction written for Congress right. so that they could, uh, you know, so that they could understand the effects of civil war. And, yeah, what I want, you know, I think sometimes like when the Oath Keepers list came out and there was like, you know, multiple members of the Oath Keepers were found in various police departments and in relatively senior roles in the Republican Party. Like that was the week of the Rust shooting. And the, the, the Rust shooting led all the news, right? Like the, like the, like the, like that was what was on people's minds, not the fact that major institutions had been infiltrated by the far right. Like, right. Uh, you know, so right. Like, I think it is, um, it is definitely a wake up call, right? Like that it, it is written to be that. And, uh, and, you know, using again, but I, I mean, it is fiction, but I really stayed close to the evidence. Like, uh, I stayed as close to the evidence as I possibly could, even, you know, cutting things that were just kind of, you know, dialogue or things like that, because I just want to stay like, okay, this is what we know. And this is right. what it looks like. And this is what you can go and see. Uh, and, and, and so that that was the idea. Yeah. You know, I think your narrative, your narrative uh, captured that like sort of tightly bound alternate future. You know, you weren't trying to make it science fiction. It was, yeah. it was, it felt very much bounded by reality. Yeah. Very much like that's how it would go. That's what would this happen. This stuff could happen this week. Right. Everything in that, everything in that book could happen this week. Like it's not like 2030 or whatever. Although, you know, there's no dates because no one knows the time and the place. And sure. no one, of course, no one actually can predict the future. Uh, but the trends are going one way. And in a way, I mean, the point of the book is like these incidents don't really matter. The, the point is that all it's going to take right. is a spark because the, because the, the right. tinder is so dry that the, yeah. the hatred and the For loathing sure. and the it, it is so intense that uh, it, all it's going to take is a tiny little flare. Just, you know, I, I think we've talked about one six a lot. The, the fact that no member of Congress or, or senator was killed that day. I yeah. think I think that would have been an inflection point that led to an absolute firestorm in this country. I think it would have been an, it I mean, would have been a horror show. You know, in 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 my country, which has almost broken up twice in my lifetime, right? Like just like no, just to be clear, this is not a no judgment, right? Like, but when it when when the party when the uh, not the party when a, when a Quebec terrorist organization yep. uh, kidnapped a British, mm-hmm. we declared martial law. Mm-hmm. Right. And that I was, remember. of course, that was probably I mean, it's debated whether it was the right thing to do. But when things feel panicky, people re- like governments overreact. They, they, they thrust down on these things. It's the most natural thing in the world for for leaders to do that. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think, uh, you know, it, it, the January 6th thing, I mean, the, it, it is so amazing that none of them were killed. Um, but, you know, I, I, I felt really heartbroken by that scene of only half of the people giving a moment of silence for the dead police officer there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that really showed me like, this is broken. Yeah. I mean, like the, you, you, a, a guy who defended you, like lost his life defending your personal security. You're not going to show up to give, to show respect to him. Correct. I mean, like how the, 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 the narrative distortion that that entails is so intense that, I mean, what can escape it? Yeah, uh, we often ask ourselves that um, there are many points where we've gone, where we've said, how could this possibly happen? I mean, the day of just yeah. hours after, right, 147 Republicans still moved forward to vote against certifying the election. Like wow. hours later, there was, you know, still yeah. remnants of the feces in the hallway, for God's sakes, of this, you know, this this violent mob, and they still went forward with it. It's um, we just don't know at what point. What is it going to take? If it if it's not that, then what what is it going to be? And you know, um, yeah. I I just don't know. We're we're worried. I I worry about the potential um, bloodshed um, all the time. Carl Bernstein of Woodward yeah. and Bernstein fame um, said last year, well, actually 2020, he he said that he worried about we were in a cold civil war. And that's that I've said this often. I've repeated it because it stuck with me because that's what I saw until January 6th. 
And I saw that civil right. war potentially warming up and going hot. Um, and you know, that that's what we're trying to avoid. So my, my last question to you, Stephen is, all right, so how do we, how do we stop this? It seems, you know, there's a certain amount of inevitability. It feels like for some folks to think, look, this is where it's going or can we stop it? Is there still hope for us to put the brakes on this? You're Americans. You're the, you're the great country of reinvention. You're the great country of personal reinvention. You're the great country of political reinvention. You, you, you're, you're, I mean, but I, I will tell you the time has come for reinvention. Like the, 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 the political stakes that you are at now are the highest ones. A democratic system that functions like the marginal tax rate. You can shelve that for a little bit. It, it, it's 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 how does the it's how does the is how does the how do you can get back to a peaceful transition of power? Does the Constitution reflect the legitimate will of the people anymore? Um, how can you adapt these institutions to the 21st century? And of course, the big one, I mean, the one that I think is most important is getting a handle on the violence now, like getting getting a handle on the domestic terrorist threat now before it's too late because when the violence starts it it it, it tends to spread i mean that just is there's very few historical examples where the where the violent when the violence starts it it dies down it really takes a while to get back to sanity so you know that the thing to me is like america of course america can do this america is the great country reinvention but it's going to take that it's it's not things are just not are not going to work out you know it's not going to be like the 60s and then we're all going to go to the 70s and it's going to be disco and lava lamps and you know the burning will have stopped like that that's <laughs> not how this cocaine. is going to go yeah and a lot of cocaine yeah. <laughs> well and there is don Ju john like, don jr he's he you know anyway um <laughs> steven we appreciate you thank, thank you so, so much, much steven a wonderful book very grateful for you to ha having written it. I think you really captured something in a way that it doesn't come across as, as an academic treatise. It comes across as something that is, you know, terrifyingly ripped from future headlines. And one more thing before we go, the, yeah. the science fiction author William Gibson has a great phrase about the future. He says, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Mm. I think yeah. the civil war is not just evenly distributed yet. I think it's probably here. It's just not visible enough to everybody quite yet but so you're right yes, also i mean valuable service to this thank you very i mean I, other people have said that you know america is just going through this first that it's coming for all the major democracies in, so i mean in a sense the, the future isn't distributed that way i'm not sure i believe that but you know that, that's that's definitely an argument i've heard yeah and one that thanks Barbara so much Walter guys for having me book. thank you Stephen. So wonderful much, book Stephen. everybody go out and get his book on on uh, amazon or wherever you buy your books yes indeed. Uh, it is well worth the read i read it in one sitting the other morning because i was sort of riveted and yet horrified and yet fascinated so <laughs> really recommend it go get it similar warning from barbara walter who we had yep. on last thursday yep. you know she pointed out that this this is percolating in a lot of other western style democracies across the world and uh we've got to pay attention to it because it, this is not an isolated incident there's something going on here um and the accelerant is social media um so rick oh one other thing that he just said that i wanted to point mm -hmm. out that we need to get a handle on the the violence mm -hmm. Um, I believe it was reported today that the FBI formed a domestic terrorist task force. Oh so, yes, and the and the and the right wing folks are losing their goddamn course, minds about it. Of course. So it's similar to 2009, and yeah. I remember because I was caught up in that whole yeah, ecosystem too. That you know, one of the first acts of of the Obama administration under Napolitano as the Homeland Security Secretary was to put out this this report on the rise of right-wing domestic terrorism yep. and Republicans lost their shit and it became all about, this is going against Patriots and second amendment. This is a way to take your guns from you and um, you know, our freedom. And I remember all of that cause I was part of it and come and that report ended up getting shelved because it of did. that. It and did. because of the political that. backlash, once again, an example of how Republicans are very good at rallying around a message and hammering it home and getting results as a political results. Fast forward, and the author of that report, I interviewed him. I think we had him on our show. He um, he was one of the he was one of the authors of that report. We had him last year on the breakdown mm -hmm. with us talking about that. And guess what? He was right. And what's the number one domestic terrorist threat right now in the country? And it's been, and, and oh, uh, President Trump. Spoiler, President it's not Trump, Antifa. <laughs> right. It's not Antifa. Trump's own FBI director, Christopher Wray, said it's 
right wing domestic terrorism. So, you know, they need to get over themselves because it's quite obvious what, you know, if, who we if, need to worry about. If, 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 if the guys in from from Steve Bannon, who is the bin Laden of the far right nationalist revolutionary movement. OK, if if Steve Bannon was up there, uh, you're broadcasting every day to 20 million people saying, I'm going to impose Sharia law and kill our enemies with a sword. And there were cells around the country openly declaring things like the, the, one of the things on the right wing media the last few days, they've been saying, get the names of all your local public health officials so that we can kill them when the when the shooting starts because they're pushing the virus, the, the vaccine on us. If that was happening and those people were Muslims, right, they'd be right. rounded up and taken to a black site. No doubt. I mean, and look, no as much as I it. want to see a hood over Steve or over <laughs> Steve Bannon's head as he's backed into a backed into a cargo plane and flown to Gitmo, you know, that's not what's happening right now. Right. That's and right. If it gets to the point where where things get loud and kinetic, um, you know, we're gonna regret not taking action sooner. Against One, these people. A- absolutely. I made the same point uh, over the weekend on MSNBC. Yeah, you did. That's that if hit. the January that at the January, thank you. If the January sixth rioters had been um, people who were not white men, it would have mm-hmm. been handled a whole lot differently. Also, and Republicans would have been singing a whole different tune, um, yeah. and which is a, a sad state of affairs. And I don't like to have to admit that, but unfortunately, we it's are. true. Um, speaking of saying things about threatening um, health officials, do you remember when Jesse Waters? made a comment a couple weeks ago at the Turning Point USA yes, conference where he said, he talked about um, going after um, uh, Fauci and that the kill shot for Fauci, if you, or what, whatever, he, but he made he used the term kill shot. And guess what? This guy got a promotion over at Fox News. He now has News. a primetime show at yeah, News. Fox, Fox News. Um, he now has a primetime show at seven o'clock. I cannot believe this. This guy is one of the most uh, insufferable jerk offs at over there at Fox. And he has now been rewarded. Anybody else would have been fired for making comments like that against someone, uh, you know, an official like Dr. Fauci, who's just simply trying to um, help save people's lives. Decades of experience, one of the most decorated um, epidemiologists in the world. And he's he's talking about kill shots and he's, oh, I was just joking. Well, you know what? Um, Of course, Jesse Waters is getting the Lincoln Project treatment and we have a little treat for the audience tonight. Take a look. And now, the top 10 craziest things Jesse Waters has said on TV. Number 10. We saw drugged out zombies chasing barefooted babies through piles of garbage with hypodermic needles and fire everywhere. Number 9. She's the type of person that would order a round of kamikazes on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Number 8. If you have a guy kneeing a guy in the neck like that, over a counterfeit 20 and you have the rest of the crew standing around and watching it looks like a premeditated hit number seven i'll what tell you why bad. it started in china okay because they have these markets where they're eating raw bats and snakes no, Jesse. <laughs> they are a very hungry people number six can you play this little piggy went to market number five the media doesn't report black on black crime. The media doesn't report black on white crime. They only report white on black crime. Number four. You got to ambush a guy like Fauci. Now you're going for the kill shot. Boom, he is dead. Number three. I'm looking at the Georgia situation too and it looks really screwy. They're finding ballots that weren't counted in the machines. Number two. No one's specifically on this show, at least, accusing anybody of committing fraud. And the number one craziest thing Jesse Waters has said on TV. Welcome to Waters World, I'm Jesse Waters. They call it Fox News, but they're not even pretending anymore. <laughs> the worst. Shout out to our our uh, rapid response team on that. You know, there, when when Roger <laughs> when Roger started Fox, um, he held that fair and balanced line close to his heart, and and it was a very effective way of them trying to 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 build that credibility they wanted over over as a news organization. And now what you've done is taken one more hour of programming and converted it into a clown show. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, Jesse, Jesse Waters used to be Bill O'Reilly's like man on the street guy. Remember that? Yep. He used to go like to like Side college of Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. And go, it was ridiculous. Fetch now, me a loofah boy. Right. <laughs> and now he's got a primetime show saying irresponsible things like that. Um, yeah. yeah. We're, so it just gives us more and more material because uh, Abe is watching. Uh, before we go, I have to say one last thing. Speaking of kill shots, Dr. Fauci was testifying today oh on Capitol God. Hill. And this feud between him and that other asshole, um, Rand Paul, no wonder his neighbor took a golf, a golf club to him. I get it now. Um, they have been going at it for, for months. And Rand Paul is a stick up his ass for Fauci. And let's not forget that Dr. Fauci, who has been gracious for most of it, he has taken so much unfair abuse mm -hmm. from this prick. Um, but the Brooklyn came out in Fauci today. And if you guys haven't seen it, Stop please go and look at it. It, it was, was beautiful. glorious. <clears throat> Fauci came with receipts and he talked about, though, the serious part of it is he talked about how over uh, a couple of weeks ago over the holidays, some lunatic was driving across country to come kill him. And he got stopped in, in Idaho yeah. uh, in a traffic, in a speed trap. And they were like, where are you going? He's like, I'm going to kill Fauci because he's killing people and somebody's got to take him out. And they found an AR-15 and ammunition in, his, in the trunk of his car. So there are consequences to this nonsense that these Republicans are putting out there and these lies that they're spewing about our, um, you know, our officials like this. And it has real implications. His life is in danger. His family's life. He travels with security now, Dr. Fauci. Sure. But he came with receipts and said, you know why this guy's doing this? To raise money. And he showed screenshots of Rand Paul's fundraising page where it has take out Dr. Fauci or, you know, defeat yep. Fauci with the contribute button. You know, and, and that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Sure. And it's a shame. But good for Dr. Fauci for saying so. And then the hot mic uh, moment when it was an another Republican senator who was talking about financial um, disclosure reports and Fauci got caught on the hot mic calling him a moron. It was great. Well, you know, if the proverbial <laughs> jackboot fits, wear it. The guy was a moron. And, you know, it's and, like, Dr. Fauci, yeah. why are you hiding your financial disclosures? Where, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but this guy's staff, or did he round him up behind the bus station? Right. Because it's called the Google machine, people. Exactly, it's public. It's financial disclosure because it's public. Anyway, on that All note, right. that is it for us. Like I said, stay tuned if you want to check out Biden's uh, speech on civil rights. I suggest you do. It was excellent. It's coming up right Perfect. after this. And tomorrow night, don't forget to tune in to We're Speaking at 7 p.m. We'll see you Thursday. Thanks, folks. See you Thursday.